Here. 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 Okay, the first item on tonight's agenda is a public comment for items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if anybody has uh, anything they want to bring up, now it's time. Okay, seeing none, thank you. We'll move on. Uh, next is the adoption of uh, tonight's agenda. So if we can have a motion for that, please. I so move. Second. Second. Okay, I'll just uh, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? Seeing none. Uh, tonight's agenda has been adopted. Next is the public comment on the consent agenda. And on the This presentation is by Jennifer uh, Gastelum from PlaceWorks on housing element update process requirements, new legislation, and timeline. This is not an action item, so it's informational only, and afterwards uh, we will have uh, public comment. So, Good evening. Uh, Anders Halge, uh, the consultant to the town of Loomis for the general plan update. So I wanted to introduce uh, Jennifer, uh, but first of all to tell you, uh, this is the last in a series of educational workshops on the general plan. This is the last element we're discussing, the housing element. Um, and so it, you know, just to let you know, this kind of rounds out that education piece. Uh, what we're in the process of planning for now are uh, two open houses uh, that will occur in either March or April once we look at dates and get people coordinated. Uh, one will be during the a weekday, one will be on a weekend in order to get the largest number of people possible uh, coming to those. Uh, we'll be updating the schedule that is uh, on the city's website to show generally when those are going to be held, but uh, we will be uh, moving forward with that. One thing that uh, Jenny will talk about tonight is that the housing element schedule for adoption may go ahead of the general plan that we're following just because of the state law. Uh, and we can work with that just to let you know. But we're looking at the general plan update, given the amount of public input we anticipate on working with, is going to take longer uh, than the housing element. So Jenny will talk about the schedule. We don't have a final schedule for the general plan update. But based on what we've presented in the past, uh, we feel that it may take a bit longer than the housing element to, to get there. And that is can be incorporated, uh, and, and we can do that in process, since you can do four general plan amendments on an annual basis, so we'll coordinate on that. Um, tonight, uh, Jennifer Gasellum uh, will be making the presentation on the housing element. Jennifer's uh, with PlaceWorks. That firm has been retained by the county of Placer to do the general plan update. Uh, we have a scope of work and budget coming in from PlaceWorks to do the component for um, the town of Loomis. And our hope is that uh, the town will retain PlaceWorks and Jenny to, uh, to do that work uh, for the town of Loomis, which will provide a lot of coordination. And Jenny will talk about how that interties uh, with the uh, county general plan up or housing element update uh, and the Loomis update and saving basically a whole lot of time in data collection uh, for the town of Loomis. Um, Jenny works for PlaceWorks. I have to tell you, I have known Jenny. She grew up across the street from my kids and grew up with my daughters <laughs> and at one time worked for me uh, and has done a number of housing elements both for my firm and also for uh, her firm, uh, including the housing element uh, that was the Amador County Sutter Creek housing element that uh, Mary Beth and I worked on a few years ago. So I have a lot of confidence in her work uh, and know that she can coordinate uh, between the County of Placer and the Town of Loomis in, in putting this together. So uh, Jenny, if you could uh, give the presentation, appreciate it. 
Good evening. Uh, Jenny Selm with PlaceWorks, thank you again for the opportunity to come and talk to you. I would like to add on to Andy's story that my senior last year of college at Cal Poly, under the Christmas tree that Christmas was an offer letter to come and work for him after I graduated. So it's one of my favorite stories to tell that I got, you know, what did you get for Christmas? Oh, I got a job. So I got to come back to school and tell everyone and everyone was very jealous. So very exciting. Um, and Loomis holds a special place in my heart. My aunt and uncle had a, had now the down, passed down generations about three or four acres in a pond on Horseshoe Bar. So I've been coming to their property for as long as I've lived, so um, I love Loomis. All right, um, now to talk about all the fun stuff. This is gonna get a little technical. Um, I'll try not to, I speak this language, so it's not foreign to me, but as you know, things are coming up, make sure to write it down and I can, I can take your questions. I'm going to go over the overview of the housing element, the update process, why we're doing this, because you're gonna probably wonder at some point, this sounds kind of like a nightmare, why do we have to do this? What is included in it, some of the more recent changes to state law, and the regional housing needs allocation process, which drives this, and we're gonna talk about the timeline for the project. So the housing element is unique in terms of of all the general plan elements, it is one of the seven mandated elements, but it includes our existing needs right now as well as it projects out, in, our, in this case, for the next eight year period. So we're projecting out housing goals and policies for the next eight years. It is also very unique in the fact that it has to go through a review process with the state. The state, we will put a document together, submit it to the HCD down in Sacramento, and they will review it for 60 days. We'll work with them on addressing the comments, and then you'll receive a conditional compliance that will then be brought back to say you all adopt it, and the council will adopt it, and then you'll be certified for the next eight year period. That is important. I'll get to that, why. Um, the components of the housing element are to review the effectiveness of the previous housing element. So there's a matrix in there that will look at these programs from the last eight years and see what worked, what didn't work. We'll add in new state law programs and then you know decide which ones to be to keep and to continue on. As I mentioned, you assess the housing needs over the eight year period and you have to look particularly at special needs groups throughout the community to see what the needs of those groups are and then analyze the land inventory and I'll get more into what that actually looks like. The reason why we do this is um, it's enforced by HCD and it's an easy thing to check off the list so that the town can continue to receive funds like the SB2 funds and other funding sources that are available. Um, if you are all familiar, the city of Folsom decided that they weren't going to do this quite a few years ago and the state took away all their authority to approve permits and they had to go through the state. They were sued, they lost millions of dollars and they had to pay all the legal fees for the people that sued them for not doing the housing element. So this is a not that difficult of a thing to do to get through this process to make sure that you can continue doing the planning that you are doing. So, and again, to get you funding for things and get you not on the naughty list is the, is the overall thing. As Andy mentioned, uh, we are working on the Placer County housing element. I'm also working on the city of Auburn's. This is the fourth housing element I'll have done for the city of Auburn. The first one I did when Andy and I first did it, <laughs> which was in the third round, which makes us kind of old. And um, we're also working with Colfax. So there will be a group of Placer County communities that all are collecting the same data. And so what we did 
previously over in Amador County was that we're able to coordinate and get all the background information into one document, have HCD approve that, and then work s separately on your land inventories and your goals and policies. But it made it more quick and efficient to have all of this information in one place that the state could just say, yes, that's good, go with that. Um, it cuts down on the time and potential costs and it just provides a little bit of continuity for the region, really, to be able to know all the, the different um, pieces of everyone's needs assessment. So if we're collecting it for one, we can collect it for four and put it all together. So um, The sections that I was speaking of, the background report, is the, is the actual piece of the needs assessment constraints that we can collect as a group to include the, and then some of the financial resources in the land inventory you, is you know by community. There could be some goals policies that are um, laid out regionally that you would want to consider, including in your document. It'll be up to you guys to decide, but you have a good solid document now. The goal would be to just update what needs to be updated to meet the state laws and what needs to be updated to reflect your future for the next eight years. These are some of the categories of things that you would need to include, you know, equal housing opportunities and sites to meet your arena and, you know, address any constraints that we include in here. It is not the town's responsibility, I want to make it clear, it's not the town's responsibility to build these units, it's the town's responsibility to set forth the sites the land at certain densities to accommodate development should developers come in and want to build it and to also not create governmental constraints through development process or any of those things. So that's the, all the things that we look at in the document to make sure that there aren't those constraints and if there are then we put in a program to see how we're going to kind of mitigate them. So if you've heard anything about <laughs> state law changes it's gotten a little wild and a little crazy with all of the new requirements. And for someone who's written over 100 housing elements, now getting into this, these new state laws, it's, uh, I find it fascinating and intriguing and interesting. Uh, it's, but I'm nerdy like that. This is not fun for some people. They think we're crazy for doing this kind of work. But um, some of these new laws, so AB 1397, is most of the laws have to do with the land inventory. It's interesting the way that HCD looks at housing elements. So the state decides that there is a, a number, they assign a number for the whole state that there's going to be, you know, 500,000 houses built in the next eight years. Then they create these methodologies, they go down to the COG level, so in this case, SACOG. SACOG then does a methodology to divvy out everyone's land inventory that's made up of all these income categories, and I'll, I'll show that to you. And the way that the states always looked at this is a land use exercise, where you as a community are identifying vacant sites and infill sites at different densities to allow for development to occur should a developer come in and want to, to develop it. The state has, that used to be the case, that's been the case for the last you know 30 years. Now the state is saying we need you to go a little bit further and if these sites aren't getting built and land in development isn't happening then <coughs> you were putting more requirements on you to show how you can actually help facilitate this development. So AB 1397 is that jurisdictions who are predominantly built out try to count sites that are not vacant. This was a big case down in San Diego and Encinitas and they tried to count land that had barns or you know, sheds and stuff on it. Well, HCD said, until you can give me a demolition permit that that's going away, we're not going to let you count that site. So they've now put that into law. So if you're trying to count underutilized sites or sites that have something on it, but there is potential, you have to show a plan for that. They also are saying, if you have something less than half an acre or something that's over 10 acres, that's not prime based on their research with developers of housing projects, that that's not going to get you it. So 
you, if you have track record of doing any of those things, it makes it easier. But we try to work within some of these parameters to make sure everything works. Um, another, so this law is very long, but basically it says they're, they're trying to get you to not kick the can down the road, which some communities do, which is you say, we have this one site, it's five acres, and it's our site that is our high density site and you've used it for four rounds of housing elements now. It's just the site that you're just going to keep counting. I, I have many communities who have done this. So the state is now saying, okay, if you're going to try to count that site again, you're going to say that if a developer comes in and wants to do an, a, a project that has an affordability covenant, like a 20% of it's affordable, then you're going to have to allow it by right. So that it, and they're also saying that if you're going to continue to count this site or these sites, you have to put by right on them. So that means that it could get approved with conditions that you've established. So it will be very important to establish what these conditions are if we have to make some sites by right that they would get approved through the planning department. Sounds scary, but it's really not that likely either <laughs> that, that this is how this works out. It, it is a thing, and I just did it in five other cities that I've just finished. We, on some of the sites, we had to make them by right, and we, you know, we, the, the jurisdiction is very um, methodical, and these are the objective design standards that we want to see for these projects. So it gives some clarity to developers, as well as some security <coughs> to you, to what this should look like. Assuming that they come in with these exact requirements, it can get approved by through the planning department. So that's what that means. Um, the, this is the Housing Accountability Act. This is also the one that says if you're not actually, again, like I mentioned, the regional housing needs allocation, they give, assign you a number, and if you do it, there's like two cities and uh, I want to say the five city, five cities are in the whole state who've actually met the arena. At the time, one of them was Beverly Hills because they had arena of about five. So they did five units and then they're off this Housing Accountability Act. Well, for the rest of the state, that's not realistic. So what they're saying here in this um, SB 35 is, is what this is called, is that if you would develop, as I mentioned, one thing will be important is your objective design standards of what you want projects to look like, then if a jurisdiction or if a developer comes in with these exact requirements on a project, then it would be approved through um, ministerially through the planning department. So they think that the state thinks they're trying to streamline things to make them easier. Oh, I, I I think in theory it's probably good, but um, <laughs> whether it works out that way. Um, so this is only approved by the planning department. It wouldn't come to the planning correct, commission or anything. Correct. So we put conditions on them? Well, you would, you would develop your checklist of your objective design standards of what you would want to be included so that you have that level of security that what you're approving is going to be, you know, for all projects. Yeah, so it is, you know, it is scary, but the reality that there's how many projects do you have coming in that that would actually happen um, that's something to think about. So, um, the no net loss one, this is a little bit trickier. This one we have to deal with quite a bit. So we identify sites in the housing element that are high density sites. If a project comes in, I have a community down in Sacramento that they have one site to meet their high density and a project came in that is single family homes and the jurisdiction said these houses are, this is exactly what we want. We want to approve this project. You can't deny it, even though if they get a conditional use permit, you can't deny it if it meets you know, the intents of this. However, now you've lost your high density site and you have to, it is on the jurisdiction's responsibility to find another site to rezone and you have to rezone that before you can 
allow this other site to build these single family homes to get rid of your high density mm -hmm. site. So it's kind of this juggling act and we'll work with Mary Beth to make sure that your land inventory is in a table that would be easily to use to put into your GIS so that you would know, okay, we counted this in the housing element, so here's what we can and can't do on this site. Or if you decide to do something that is you know, not what the intent of the site is, that the repercussions are you have to find another site. If they, buy, if they build high density but it's still not very affordable, then we're still on the hook to find another place? Um, or not? That's a good question. question. Um, really good question. So you are not on the hook. You, if the site is high density, 20 units an acre, and they build a, high, a 20 unit an acre project, then they did what the site is intended to do. What, where that gets you is that in counting that site to meet your arena, you've lost that affordability on it because you're assuming that whatever that site is and what you're saying is it's a market rate and it's not affordable. So you will have to find another site. Yeah. So it's a juggling act that you have to do th to maintain your either units built or approved um, throughout your whole eight year planning period. So, but you have to find another site before you allow that project to go. Yes. Because you can say the project's built and we don't have any more sites available. Right, and then all of this is kind of subject to who's watching you. <laughs> and it's, you know, your level of comfort or your level of, um, you know, because you don't want to get slapped with the lawsuit that you don't, you know, if some, there's lots of advocates out there. There's lots of people who are tracking this type of stuff and, and they want to find an opportunity like that to, to file something. So. Again, it's kind of your where you're at in terms of how who's watching. Okay. Um, with all this land, with all these laws, it's a process, and we're working through what the, the the state puts together. These well, the state doesn't. The legislature puts together these laws that aren't completely worked out. Luckily, work we have an end with HCD, so we're kind of trying to help figure out what some of these are, what they want, what they want to look like. We just finished Mendocino County, um, the, the community of Willits, and Tehama County, they all just had to get adopted. And so Arcata was another one. So there was just like four or five that we had to, the state was like, oh, we want to do this now, and this is how we're going to interpret this law. So it's kind of like the wild west of planning in terms of trying to figure out what HCD is looking for. So. The good news is, while when we're going to be fully into this, we'll have a better idea of, <laughs> of what all these of of what they're figuring out, and they will have a better idea, which is the more important part. Since we're kind of like that's not what you said over here, so let's you know get some consistency. So working through some of that is is the very interesting part. Okay, so this is what I mentioned previously, which is the regional housing needs allocation, and this is basically what drives the process. So the state, like I said, comes up with a number, gets divvied out down to the COG. At the COG level, for the next eight years, they're assuming 153,512 new units. Based on methodology, uh, this is broken down into 352 units, and that's across four income categories. Just for a frame of reference, I looked up what your previous RENAs were. So your fourth round RENA, which was from 2006 to 2013, was 147 units. Your fifth round RENA from 2013 to 2021 was 154 units. And now this round is 352. So you've, um, the state is projecting there's going to be more growth during this next eight year period. This, this is in addition to the ones that we already have? Yeah, those were already planned I mean, for. Yeah, the that 352 was just, is new. 352 is the new number. But on top of the other numbers? No, no, those yeah, were for your previous That replaces, rounds. right. So yeah. yeah. This yeah. is what we have. Correct. Today. Total. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Total. Not Total. It's still a lot. Well, it's much higher than your last two, There's but no. again, the last one being during the recession back 
they didn't, there was like a catch up from the recession and so the 147 and 153 were pretty low compared to the 352. Yeah. Do you have a breakdown of like the levels? That yeah. I thought I put that in here, but maybe I didn't. Um, yeah, they're like, oh. I believe your lower income need is, let's see, um, less than 100 units. So. so now once we, if let's say we meet this number and they're all built, do they come back and say, okay, now we want more? No. Nope. Or is that the end? Nope. So this had we built the 147, we would have been done? No, no, no. You get a new <laughs> allocation every eight years. Okay. this is new. And it these are adds. based on new units. Okay. So these need to be done within eight years. Again, yes. You need or to allocate. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. You need to allocate the land, which we have to do now to show the state that it's available. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean they're built. Correct. Right. You just allocate the land. Well, it is not your job to build them because right. the town's the not in the, the yes, yes. But if it keeps going that we allocate the land and nothing is built continually, will someone come down on us and say, hey, you know, we need to be doing better or... We're well, that's where it. the Housing Accountability Act comes uh, into place. Yeah. So every year you have to do your housing element annual report that Mary Beth does and you report to the state how many units you've built. <coughs> at all income levels and um, and so based on how many you built is how they look at your housing accountability and that's and then they put on percentages of like if a project comes in that's you know 25 or 35 percent affordable you have to allow it by right because you're in this category of not building enough units but again it's you know it's all market driven so it's kind of hard and they don't give you money to build units so it's kind of like we're doing the best we can. So in a situation like ours where I looked at the, the planning status report and it was like five in the last year, right. what does that do well, to us? Is no, it, it doesn't do anything to you. I mean, it's your reporting. It's You're doing the best you can. You're not, we, the other things that you report on are progress on your programs. So if there were things that you didn't do in your programs, then there would be a reason to come, you know, slap you on the wrist. There's not. You're doing everything that you can in, you know, you're allowing for development to occur. It is what it is that it's not occurring. <laughs> There's not much they can, you know, they're not giving you money to build. So yeah. again, mm -hmm. um, this accommodating the arena as a, so what we're talking about for the high density, which I said is a little less than a hundred units in your higher debt, in your need to be, we need to identify that at 20 units an acre. So for the larger areas, it's 30 units an acre down in, I think Colfax is 15 units an acre and some of the more rural areas are 10. So 20 is doable. I work in a lot of the Sacramento jurisdictions that are 30 units an acre. And we have to usually do analysis that says we can actually build units at 20 that are affordable. So I like this position to be in at 20 units an acre. It makes for an easier land inventory. Should there be a case where we identify that you do not have enough land at 20 units an acre to meet these 100 or so units, you do have three years to rezone to identify sites to accommodate some of those, but you will have to call out the sites or call out a list of them. So in down um, in a few other communities, we they develop a list of like 30, and it will be one of these 30 that they rezone if that's the case. So, and then you have three years to do that, and they will come knocking at your door. You will have to report every year when until you've done that. And if you didn't do that, then they could take away your certification. So I think with the general plan update and the land use element update that we're not hoping that that's the case to do a rezone, but we'll you know figure it out. Um, you can count second, we can assume some second units. There's, we, we can assume a few things. So we know how to work around that. <laughs> Uh, the planning period for this time is May 15, 2021. I'll show you the schedule on the next slide. And this will go through May 15, 2029. It has to be adopted by May 15, 2021. They do give you 
120 days from that May date for all the, the stragglers to get it in um, to work through the HCD. So it's a 60 day review, then uh, you get comments, then if you have to work with them, we go back for another review. Once you adopt it, it's a 90 day submission. So they take it for another 90 days before you get it. But once you get your conditional compliance after that 60 day review, you're okay. So here's the schedule. I think um, admin draft February through May. We have outreach meetings in June and August, but Andy was talking about a few different, I think we can adjust that to make it work with some of your other meetings. I wouldn't want to do extra meetings if we didn't have to. It's hard enough getting people to attend, so we want to make sure that we get um, the most input as possible. Getting a public review draft out by October. Again, HCD review, that being the 60-day review, bring it back next a year from now, January, and then adoption in February, and then submit it to the state for their 90-day certification. And then you're done for eight years. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, how does the landowner play into this? Because they may be willing or unwilling. They may, and they say, yeah, you can zone my property however you want. I ain't never going to sell it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so would we... In that case, if we identified that, we would not uh, identify that land. As um, being I think uh, in compliance, if, if that is you know. No, uh, I mean, I I think you do the best of, to your ability to find sites that are willing are willing, um, and you wouldn't want it to get down to that process. I have been in communities where they've went ahead and adopted it in rezoned sites. In in opposition. Yeah. So the, well, I was on the group that worked on the, the planning commission worked on this more last, the 2014 round, and it seems like we're going to be involved at all this time. But at that time, it looks like some of the rules have changed. It was only a willing owner, a minimum of one acre instead of one, instead of half acre, and it had to be near transportation for people that didn't have cars. And um, there those, were a, those a are all still I ideal or wishes for sure. Wish lists. Yeah. Well, but but has the one of that it needed to be a willing landowner no, gone that away? Has, I mean, it, no, it doesn't have to be a willing landowner. But you, you know, as a community, you would want to try to work. I mean, that was someone. in the list of things that we were told that oh, that yeah. was no, a that's rule. Not a, no, that's not, not a rule. A, no, that's not a rule. But again, we're all going to play nice, hopefully, and <laughs> figure what, that out. What are the groups of special need groups? Um, so single parent households, seniors, farm workers, um, homeless, persons with disabilities. So I know the county had um, they had a stakeholder group that met to help with the design standards. Mm -hmm. Will we be able to do something like that to bring in, you know, some consultants that are architects and mm -hmm. I think through the general plan? Would you say? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of work I think it's even more important now with maybe right. not having as much authority with the approval of projects to have those standards in place. And that's one of the questions that HCD asks. How are you handling your SB 35 streamlining and what are, have you developed your objective design standards? Um, can you tell us what is the rationale between the limit on the 10 acres? Um, the ra they, if it's over 10 acres right. is they, they have apparently through their developer consultations, they've said that it's too hard to subdivide or it costs more money to have to break down a 10 acre site. And also they don't want your, you just have one 10 acre site of all high density. I mean, they want it to be throughout the community if possible or just on one side of less than 10 acres. There's kind of a number of issues. They don't want to create like a whole low income you know, what if you have ten acres side by side, two lots? You know, 
for is some it? reason they have decided that over 10 acres is not conducive to actual development without you know costs associated I with mean, subdividing it so well then you have to say there has to be a certain distance between the 10 acres and, and what might that be sure um, I don't it would be you could develop something that is not a constraint to the development of housing but Okay. Well, it would just need to be less than 10 I mean, these acres. are things that can come up. Sure. Because we have a lot of you lots. You have two 10 acre sites side that by are side. high density that are. We have, we have right now, we have one, what, nine, nine something acre site. Okay. And that's okay. It. Under 10? Yeah, Good. I mean, that's still. And it's only been, this it's only been in one housing cycle designated. Okay, then I we think. don't have to put the buy right on it. So that's something we have, that, you know, we have to do is go through the last inventory and this inventory to identify which of those sites are carryover. And there are communities who are like, we don't want this one to be a by right because it's too much of a political issue, we're taking it off the list. Or if we have an abundance where we have more than enough, in Mendocino County we had more than enough, so we were able to take you know, half of them off the list and not count them so that they don't have to go through that process. So. So they definitely have to be labeled by right. Someone can't just come in and say, I want this to be by right. No, you'll have to do, um, we, we all have to be a program in the general plan that okay. says these sites are by right. by right. It will have to be identified. Okay. And how do we know how many of those there are that we have to designate? Uh, no, just how much it takes just to get to the land inventory. So I haven't. So at the 20 units, for instance, yes, as 20 correct. per acre, 20 then acre. that's what we would have to do. Correct. Mm -hmm. For at least the 100 or so. Yeah. But here, are we even meeting it for the moderate level? Um, you know, we have, part of doing the housing element is looking at the uh, what's been built at what income levels. So if there are um, manufactured homes that couldn't count towards the moderate, or we sometimes can count second units towards the low or moderate, and we take them up to the moderate if necessary, if you have enough you know, how many second units are you processing per year? Are you, then if we're contact some of those people to see what the rents they are charging or if, you know, what the situation is, you can count those towards either lower income or pos or sometimes we bump them to count your moderate category if needed. If it's a family member though and that's not paying rent, then how do you do? They don't get it's any a, credits it's then. It's trickier, yeah. To, um, we can still count it, I think. If we can get enough other ones, we can kind of uh, couple it all together. Like average sort yeah. of thing? Mm -hmm. To say that Plus the average ones are this price. And um, can it be a designated thing like a senior community? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> So there were community residents that met today with the town manager, and we had a really interesting discussion about inclusionary zoning. Oh, yeah. Um, and so is this something that would be addressed in the housing element, or would that be more of the general plan update? Um, I, it could be in either. It could be part of the discussion of the housing element if it's something that it, you know the town is looking at doing. It could be more of a, a larger, broad discussion um, with it's a big discussion, so <laughs> on the level of the general plan update on that, on whether that's something that you would want to include. And then since you're also working with some of the smaller, um, you know, um, you know Colfax and Auburn, and my understanding is, I mean, it's going to be really hard for the smaller towns that if we're going to have smaller developments for, you know, a developer to come in and let's say they're only doing 50 homes and if there's a 10% to do five, I mean, just because of the, um, the scale, that's, that's much more difficult. Is there a way to be able to combine some of these smaller areas so that you can pull and, um, I don't know, maybe some help credit and work together so that those numbers are larger in scale? So the arena is done by community. You're within the confines of your city limits for meeting the arena. So but I mean the production part with getting credit for it. Yeah, no, it is a it's a number game. 
by community. But I mean, with the developers, in order to produce um, just you know the production itself can be so expensive. And I mean, I think the city of Roseville, their charge is something to the effect of like three hundred fifty to four hundred fifty thousand per unit. Right. Um, and that's at a higher, a larger scale. Yes. And so if there was a way that, again, developers could work with these smaller communities, and so let's say we had a small development of 50, Colfax had a small development of 50, Auburn had a small development of 50, but it was the same developer who then could, you know, now produce 15 as opposed to five, that's at least a little bit smaller, but I guess, you know, 150. Just by, you know, this I haven't seen that, but it's not, I mean, nothing is out of the realm of possibility. I think it comes down to the fees and um, for your public works and your school fees and your park fees and your all, all those other costs that are without outside of the controls of the planning department. So um, I, I don't, I, it would be if the communities wanted to work together to do that, I think it, you know. I know there are communities that are establishing like a trust, a regional trust fund that they all pay into to help developers a situation like that. That would be something that could maybe work if all the communities, the little ones are willing to, you know, participate. It's a great idea. Is there a calculated value of what an affordable home is yes. by jurisdiction or something? Um, it is by... Uh, by the region, by the county, or the MSA. So it's like Sacramento Placer County area. I don't have that number with me, but right. yes, there, that is all included. The technical background report is pretty number heavy. Mm -hmm. Includes all these, you know, what does affordability look like? What is, you know, what are houses going for? What are rents? What, you know, what's available? All that kind of stuff. We do quite extensive level of information, so. Our, our current one does, for the 2014, I remember, did have figures for uh, the rent level for families of, you know, ABC. Yes. And what would be the purchase price Correct. that they could afford. We use, an, we use a for certain mortgage incomes. calculator to, to get those based on rates and taxes and fees and all that to, mm -hmm. to put that together. What else? Okay. Anybody else? Um, Questions? Does staff have anything well, you wanted to? Go ahead. We have one one big place with the village that has quite a bit of developable space. Yeah. But and we, I think we have on the books for years uh, one subdivision that's thirty something and another one that's maybe thirty one that. Who knows when they'll get developed, but our typical subdivisions yeah. are something like six or seven units. We have more uh, minor land divisions around here than anything else. But how does that kind of thing affect us? I mean, we, those are, if you're doing six or seven units, and most of them are not in here at this point, only maybe the the ones that are like 30 or 31 are even going to be put in di by developers. Most of the ones around here, the small things are sold as um, just individual lots. So how does that kind of situation affect what we do? Um, the land is available and we tell the story that you just said. So it's all a story of how, you know, here's what here's what's deed restricted, here's what the the you know DA plan says how many units can be accommodated and you know we assume these will be market rate and you know we include those in the inventory and all that so now things that already have an approved subdivision that aren't built out are those back in the hopper or if you, once you've got your approval it's okay and will they have to pay fees inclusionary fees or something I, it would be if it's in the development. It would be worked out in the development agreement. I, I don't think if you were to establish an inclusionary program right now that that would be retroactive. Yeah, I mean you'd have to talk to your attorney on that one. So, <laughs> but once once they've got an approved subdivision, are they also subject to a saying, "Hey, we're, we we want to put this something else"? 
we want to make this 20 units an acre. So I guess I don't quite understand the question. The question is if you've got an approved subdivision and the, the property owner decides to change their mind and have No, the property there, owner just plain hasn't hasn't built anything. Hasn't yet. built anything. Are they do they need to be worried that we're going to put it at twenty units an acre sometime? That would depend on what entitlements exactly are already on that right. land, whether or not we could make that change at that point. Yeah. Okay. If everything is if if everything is already ready i mean they're all they've got their full subdivision map act stuff and all that so that if they wanted to they could sell lots one two and three tomorrow do they still would they still need to worry that we're going to look at that for 20 units an acre they may and i think i'd need to look at a more concrete example than that to give a definitive answer okay yeah, it sounds like it you're talking about a, an already approved Right. Project. I don't think you can go back if you've approved something. Well, I don't know. That's the question. <laughs> that asking. becomes a timing question of how long has it been approved? How long is the map good for? Right. Because so we've the, had people come and renew. Yeah, if they renew it. Yeah. So the, again, it's we'll a it highly expire. fact yeah. dependent yeah. kind of analysis. There's no okay. kind of. And it probably varies for yeah. development agreement of what was you know agreed upon. So. And we do have a lot of space that looks vacant or not but there's no infrastructure if, oh that was one of the requirements with that it, that it had to have infrastructure well it may have a road and pg&e but not sewer water gas those kinds of things or be near transportation we will have to include information about what utilities and are available to sites to show that they are viable options Okay. If somebody oh. had, um, you know, an ADU and they wanted to be restricted, who would they go to to do that? Um, Mary Beth, I guess. Um, I don't know that you're in the business of uh, restricting units. So I guess the if county. they, uh, so that would, I don't. I, I'm not sure what the benefit of that would be or how that would look as a private individual owner to, you know, I think whatever rent they're charging, if it was built, we could count it at that income level at that time. Um, that's part of the research that we do through the housing element. The more likely scenario where something like that would show up is if somebody's considering adding an accessory unit and if there's some sort of financial benefit through some grant program or bank financing where deed restriction for, for low or moderate income there are communities would be that then, then there might be something. Yeah, there are communities who've established like a program, an ADU program where they by where a lot of jurisdictions are using their SB2 funds to develop um, prototypes of ADUs and some waiving of some fees if you're saying it's going to be affordable and you sign a you know a document with the with the community to to do that then you could count that there there are some robust communities that we have a community down in Southern California that they have no vacant land so their plan to meet their arena is solely based on this ADU program that they're going to develop and how they're going to deed restrict things so very interested to see how that's going to work. Are those commitments typically 30 years still? Or, or If you were getting some sort of like state grant funding, um, state or federal, there's like, you know, 50 and 65 years. If it's a community level, uh, it, you could set it at whatever you wanted. I would say at least for the eight year planning period. Oh. Okay. Um, I, I heard. I don't remember. It was some news program, but um, that, that they were considering. I think the end of this on the 31st of this month changes to some of the newer uh, housing laws. Do you need, know anything about what they're proposing, or you'll just have to wait and see, like everybody else? Sure. I don't know about any. I know that a lot got approved. You know, starting January with ADUs and all that kind of stuff. I don't know where you. The January 31st date refers to the two-year bills, like SB 50. Okay. For yeah. any of those to take effect, they have to be passed by the 31st, so Friday. 
in the case of SB 50 that made it out of committee on Monday, I believe. So it will either be voted on tomorrow morning, Thursday or Friday, from what I've been reading, most likely tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I think, think this is, um, it's really important when we have these, the workshops to help the public to understand this because we are going to, the town, the commission, the council are going to have to, looks like, pass quite a bit of change right. that people are going to be very, very unhappy about. And whether we even are happy about all of it, we'll have to do it. It's just something we're going to have to do. So well, I, I appreciate think it's, your attitude. it's really <laughs> <laughs> important that <clears throat> we do the best job that we can to help people Explain understand that sure. because even with the three stories that we were re required to allow for the the one that there are one nine acre 20 DUA, DUA I think we said 20 to 25 we still had people kicking and screaming about how dare it we allow three stories in Loomis. It doesn't fit Loomis. And I think if people understand we don't have a real choice on some of this and we just are going to do the best we can, um, it, it will help. Otherwise, people are angry at us um, and angry that people aren't listening, you know, the town isn't listening to us and things like that. So I, I think um, those workshops are going to be critical to people having some kind of understanding and feeling like, I don't know what their input can be, but they need to, people in this town like to feel like somebody listened to me, somebody's taking my ideas. Um, I don't know what, what that could be in this particular case because it sounds like it's going to be pretty much put together by the time you get there. But um, I think we saw with the village and you probably have heard stuff on the village. I think people did not feel that they were being listened to or they didn't, and they didn't really feel that they had the input that they're used to in this town. Sure. So uh, no, I think, I, I think it, these I workshops think are gonna be really important on, understand for the public. understand that very well, and we you know, have yeah. all the tools and tricks to make sure that everyone is is, is feeling included through, you know, we try to not just do meetings where we're just standing there like me talking, you know, just telling you everything. We try to make them more interactive. We try to make them an open house style to make it so that people can come in their free time. Um, so we're not, you know, taking up their time and we try to make it informative and we try to give them, you know, multiple opportunities to comment and to to help with the process. So I think uh, your your comments are very well heard. And I think they will want to know about the, the second and third dwelling unit rules because they're not going to like the five foot set side setback and things like that. In case one goes in next door to them, they need to know how that happened? That we don't have a choice on right. that either. Right. I mean, we can you can put it the best that you can, but I think if people are forewarned, they they may not like it, but they won't be so angry about it or caught off guard. Yeah, caught off guard. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, okay, we let, what we'd like to do next is move on to public comment. So we will open to that, and I presume you'll be around to maybe yeah, help sure. us with some of the answers uh, to some of the questions. Thank so thank you. Okay, uh, public comment, please. Jesse Lassman, 6133 Smoke Report. Wow. And we, we, I, I, I thought we were heading for 190 was the magic number. Yeah, I, and, and now I, I see 352, and I'm like, yeah. wow. Um, I know you're not safe, Bob, but <laughs> how did we get 352 and Auburn got 310 when we're half their population? Uh, like I said, it, I was thinking we were getting estimates last year when SACOG did their presentation. We were thinking 190 range, but to go from 153 all the way to 352, you have your job ahead of you. Wow. Um, uh, 
I guess there's no comment because again, SACOG's not here to justify those numbers, but like I say, it just blows me away when I compare us to, I mean, we're right on line with Colfax, not a problem. The rest of them look just fine, but comparing to Auburn with twice the population, it's like, wow, we're, we're, getting, we're getting stuck with more. Uh, when uh, council, or not uh, council, planning commission member uh, uh, Wilson brought up about the three stories, it was because we were told over and over you couldn't get 20 units per acre unless you went to three stories. Right. And that was where people were frustrated. They kept coming up with ideas of row houses and whatnot. And they're like, well, can someone else explain to us, can we get 20 units per acre only going up to two stories? And we never got that option. So that was a lot of frustration on that part. From the developer side, it was, no, no, no. I have to do three stories in order to get 28 houses per acre. And we were just asking, is there any other choice? Any other ideas? Okay, and that was all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> William Pumble, Senior, 6280 Horseshoe Bar Road. Um, yeah, getting to that 352 number, if I remember a meeting back a ways ago, we have like 640 designated units for our 40-year development plan within the town boundaries and I was like how do we yeah that 352 number within eight years was kind of a, a shocker um, so yeah, this is going to be a challenge and and I can tell you from personal experience that a lot of people are not going to be happy because the state has interfered with everything and it's very sad because it's not just this that they've interfered with so thank you yeah I don't know how we're going to make those numbers Mix. Yeah. David Green, 3486 Delmar. Um, I just have a question. Uh, what is to keep a community from picking someone who's lived in the community for a really long time and saying, this person we guarantee is not going to sell their land. Let's zone that to be really high density. And then they will never sell. I mean, I, I can't be the only one to have thought this. So I'm sure, and we're a small enough community, so what? Okay, it doesn't seem like there's any rule against it. Like we could just pick 10 people who live in Loom. Am, am I wrong in say, thinking that that's correct? So you're going to rezone that property. So, so we would ask that. We would say, this property has been in your land for three generations. Is it going to stay in your land, in, in your in your family for the next long for the next eight years? And then say if they say yes, then say would you be willing to let us rezone your property to high density? With, and you promise not to sell it for eight years. Would that be our It's it's a terrible way to do it. I I, I I'm not I'm not condoning this, but I but it seems like that 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 is. I, I have morals that other people don't, and I think that there are other places that will do that. But yeah, does that seem like that? I know that's probably, I mean, there's proper cases of that. However, you have to show what the potential is on these sites and why this is vi a viable site. So you can't just say, we rezone this property and it's just going to sit here. Or you have to say, oh, a developer's interested, or this is a long transit and it's a perfect location for this, and we're marketing it and all what these things. Right. So this, the it's all right. programs to help allow for this development to occur. So, so we're not just, it's not just zoning. Right. It's zoning and more of a, we're condoning yes. building, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, is anybody else? Okay. All right, uh, we'll, we'll get a, go ahead and close public comment. And I don't know if we had any follow-up questions. I think you kind of answered. We already discussed, I don't know if you came in a later, a little bit of touched on that uh, possibility about the landowner, you know, locking up the property. So it really, I think, kind of depends on integrity of the town government, not to see that that happens, and that will be our goal. Uh, the 352, I'll give a quick answer to that. Uh, it's basically established by SACOG. They hand those numbers to us. And if anybody wants to expand on that and how they got those numbers to answer that question. Um, well, okay. Did, when, they, when they did I'm their sorry. presentation, but, didn't they say that um, our numbers bumped up because of our income level and our population and our land availability? Land availability and that 
we haven't built anything. Yeah. So that redistributed um, grand total number went throughout the state and trickled down to each jurisdiction individually. And before, will, will we have like a, a whole um, housing stock of what we currently have at all levels and where so that we kind of have, you know, a strategic idea of where to put what? That, that will go with the land inventory. Um, available, vacant, built, what's built, how many units, all of that, so it'll go parcel by parcel and have that breakdown. Okay. I have a question about D David's David's scenario. Wouldn't wouldn't it, if we're having to do the zoning is in there to buy rights on it, right? Then the developer has the they. What's the, the, then there's a conflict between the owner who doesn't want to sell and ours saying you can build on it by rights? Yeah, that's probably not going to be a viable site. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, I think we'll go ahead and we'll close this item. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. It's very informative, and we'll look forward to a lot of work ahead. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so the oh, next no. item look forward to is... Um, <laughs> Item number five, and it's Loomis Mill Group Incorporated Conditional Use Permit and Design Review on Taylor Road. So we'll start off with a staff report, please. Thank you. Good evening. Let me get settled here. Good evening. The item you ha have before you is a conditional use permit design review for Loomis Mill Group, a uh, project site of 3800 Taylor Road. My PowerPoint is just kind of pictures. So <laughs> it's just to kind of give you an idea of the area we're looking at, what we're looking at. So I'll kind of go through the staff report um, to provide the information and then answer any questions you have. So as originally proposed, well, let me start with the existing site and how it looks in today's current environment. Former WW molding site that was completely trashed and junked and the town remediated all of that. Uh, even through the environmental cleanup of a, a diesel spill contaminated soil that has been remediated, backfilled. Uh, we just received the letter of clearance on that property, so environmental cleanup is done and complete as of this point in time. Uh, the project, the property itself, three parcels. Uh, back in April, the, the under town ownership, the town merged those three parcels into one. The assessor's office will not reassign it a parcel number because it's owned by the town, but once the transaction is completed where the land, uh, the property is sold, then they will combine it into one parcel and accept that merger as one parcel. So a little confusing between the way the county assessor works and the way we typically process uh, lot splits or mergers. But it, it will come around. It just seems a little confusing that I can refer to it as one parcel, but it's really three. So just a technicality there. The project that's proposed uh, originally came in in two phases. Uh, phase one is the, the market area in the main building, and phase two being an amphitheater, uh, event type thing. When we look at them together, it really created a lot of uh, 
impacts related to traffic and noise and the building itself really didn't do that but the amphitheater did so we bifurcated the project and pulled the amphitheater portion out so that at this point in time all we're looking at doing is the approval um, and conditions for phase one which is the market the brewery the distillery uh, bakery cheese shop dining uh, and bar little outdoor uh, seating on the south end of the building uh, and it, it is set up kind of in terraces in those half circles um, but that's just all concrete work and stuff so at this point in time they'd like to uh, put in all the improvements and then later come back for approval of the amphitheater in a couple years year whatever down the line once they have the funds to do all of those studies I reached out to a, a noise consultant and a noise study was about $9,000 for the amphitheater, but the traffic study could be anywhere between ten dollars to $40,000. So when you start putting all that together, it's like, yeah, let's hold off on that for now and at least get the building and the site improvements done and go forward at a later date with if and when that comes forward. The project is consistent with both the general plan and zoning policies, goals, and uh, all of that. There's no inconsistencies there. The project engineer and applicants are here. So when we get to that point, if you have any questions, just know that they're available to answer those kind of questions for you. Uh, the site is served by existing utilities. Uh, sewer, trash, fire, water, gas, electric, and telephone. Uh, all of those kind of improvements, upgrades, whatever is required for the project will be done with the improvements that are, and to the agency standards individually. So based on the comments received from those outside agencies, those get rolled into the conditions of approval that the applicant must meet. We can't change that. That's between the applicant and the agency. So. As you see their comment letters, you'll see all of that information floated back down into the conditions of approval. So the building itself as proposed is 18,474 square feet. The total of all three parcels is 177,725 square feet. So the building on the whole parcel, all three parcels, uh, equates to about 10% lot coverage. There's the interior floor plan that kind of shows you the layout. Uh, the, the distillery is on the right hand side. The grain silo that's out there or the silo that's existing at the current site um, is being proposed to be repurposed for the distillery and to be used as a hopper for that. So it's kind of cool that at least it gets to stay on site. It will move to the right hand side of the building versus being on the left side where it is now. But at least it gets repurposed and I think that's pretty cool. They originally were trying to use the existing frame of the building, but it wasn't structurally um, available to have that repurposed. So that the frame portion of the building will go, but the grain silo will stay. <coughs> Here are the elevations, uh, north, south, east, and west. So uh, it, it totally blends in that shed to shed look of Loomis. It, to me it kind of said blue goose but different, but kind of interesting that on one end of Taylor will have blue goose and then on this end. So I think it'll kind of balance it out pretty nicely and, and blend with the integrity of the town. Oops. 
I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> One of the um, things you're asked to do tonight, besides conduct a public hearing, is adopt the notice of exemption uh, for CEQA. And we've defined that as a section 15332 class 32 infill development project. It totally meets that requirement. So we also ask you to adopt the um, CEQA. And then the resolution approving the project with conditions. Uh, all total, the conditions that are outlined here are 45. And based on some conversations I've had over the last couple of days, and I provided, there were some copies of additional conditions or revisions uh, on the back table. But if you haven't seen those, ta-da. So some things, just the first two um, for revision was just kind of language cleanup uh, for condition of approval number 20. The original condition kind of just specified driveway and uh, parking. So any grading does require a permit. So it just cleaned it up to say any grading requires a grading permit. <laughs> uh, 29, the shared parking agreement between Loomis Mill Group. And that's probably, they have plenty of parking for the building. So the shared parking agreement really doesn't come into play until later. But in order, if for whatever reason there is insufficient parking, they're going to have to either now or later, I don't see it now, uh, create a shared parking agreement between their neighbors. So the original conditions applied to high hand. That may change, who know, you know, what if that business changes names or something? So I genericed it so it was adjacent property owners as applicable. There are three new conditions that I'm recommending. And again, they're standard conditions, but they really warrant inclusion into the conditions. Um, when you kind of drill down and you look at them, it's like, forgot that, forgot that. So uh, new condition number 30 uh, is related to landscaping. Uh, the landscaping plan that was included in your package is a preliminary plan. And it, it just needs to be refined. That refinement, when it comes back forward for a final landscaping plan, is approved at staff level. But I wanted to make sure that the applicant was aware of that and those requirements of the landscaping plan. Uh, number 31 to insert uh, relates to general property development. Um, including outdoor lighting, uh, performance standards, storage, undergrounding of utilities, and the like. So I didn't feel the language that was in the conditions really addressed that, and I kind of wanted to hammer it home. Boom. And then number 32 uh, talks about sidewalks, which one of the beginning conditions talks about construct curb gutters and sidewalks. Uh, Per town code, but you know, sidewalks was a, a discussion I had with several people, so it I, it's kind of reiterated, but important nonetheless. So if you want me to strike it, I will, but it can't hurt to have it in there again. <laughs> As I said, the um, applicant, architect, and all of those people are here. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And uh, thank okay, you. thank you, Mary Beth. So, any uh, questions, comments from the planning commission <coughs> or staff? <laughs> at, this, at this point, I, I was thinking about phase two, which some some place I read is supposed to be covered with grass. In other words, not just left out there blank and muddy or whatever. Is that covered someplace in here? Because we're only dealing with phase one tonight. We're only dealing with phase one and 
within phase one, their landscaping plan proposes that as grass. It'll be okay. sod. So it just won't sit there. Yeah, I don't, I don't care what it is. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it has to be mowed grass, you know, with water used, but just so it's not left as a bare, as a muddy bare field. Spot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions from staff before we move on to the uh, applicant? So on this drawing we have here, phase one is everything that's basically shaded or in color? Correct. Okay, so we get the whole paved parking lot? Yes. Up front. So. Okay. Ah, yeah, okay. Good. good for now. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mary Beth. We're going to go. We'll go ahead and move on now. So next, as we uh, open the uh, public hearing, and we'll invite the applicant to make a presentation. Hi, I'm right. Scott with High Hand, and um, I'm here with um, the Loomis Mill Group, which uh, consists of High Hand and uh, Loomis Basin Brewery. Uh, first of all, I just personally want to thank, uh, on behalf of uh, LBB and High Hand uh, town staff, um, for helping us guide us in this process. Um, for um, Tom, our civil engineer, and uh, Mike and Maureen, uh, architects, um, I'm a plant guy. He's a beer guy. <laughs> it's taken a lot of effort to get us here, and without town staff and without their help and support. Uh, we wouldn't be here, so we really appreciate this opportunity to bring the project uh, before you. Um, outside of that, um, we're excited about the project. Um, you know, I, I moved here in 1969, so to sit here now and think about this after opening a high hand, it's a little bit surreal for me. And um, you know, I, I won't, I won't lie and say it's not scary. But that fear is also muddled and controlled and backed up by um, a lot of, of decades of experience, success. This isn't my first rodeo. This isn't their first rodeo. We both bring our expertise to this project, a unique clientele, and uh, we think we're going to bring something very unique to not only Loomis, but to the region, and uh, to continue to bring and draw people into um, the town of Loomis and to put it on a map in a much bigger, more regional draw than LBB and High Hand has been able to do on their own. Um, if I may address phase two for a moment, because there's probably some questions around that. I think, I think the word amphitheater kind of got stuck with the project in the beginning. Originally it was a um, stadium um, that seated 6,000, 7,000 people. Uh, we paired, I'm just joking, guys. Uh, <laughs> no. um, I kind of viewed it as more of a park-like environment, to be honest with you, a place where the community can come, where we can spread our events out a little bit more, um, either have art festivals, um, different types of events. It's not just stuck around um, a, a brewery or a distillery or a food court venue, but other types of things. And um, so... I think uh, the word amphitheater is kind of um, kind of not the term I would like to use, as I'd more like to use kind of a, more of a community park-like space for that. So it'll probably be become more of that than it will this full-blown stadium with 15,000 people on bleachers, um, as we all know of amphitheaters. So anyway, um, again, I, I don't know what questions you have, but uh, we're excited about it. We are going through uh, the steps we have to do to go to the next step to uh, move along. And again, could not have done it without the support of, of town staff. Um, Sean and our, our consultants over here just could not have done it at all. So I really appreciate the opportunity to bring it before you. Okay. Thank you. Don't, Thank you. don't, uh, don't, don't go, uh, Scott, I think we'll probably have some questions for you guys now. We're, we're just getting started. <laughs> okay, shoot. <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, commissioners have questions? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, on the, the plan where they show what it looks like, it has a blue, is that the colors, what they're going to be, like a blue roof, for real? Would you like it to be blue? I do Would like it. I do like it. But I didn't know if the, the siding is going to look like weathered wood, or is it a color? I'm not quite sure. You, you know, in, in, I, I think by the time it's flushed out, it's going to be really accurate to what you see. Okay. Um, I'm looking at a, a fruit shed look. Okay. You know, it's an 
extension of high hands, extension of blue goose, and it's the exclamation part on that side of town right. that encompasses that consistency. It would fit right in if that's you, the case. You bet. Is the food area, is this a family friendly thing or just a place to come and get drunk? You know, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I stopped drinking, so the first Yeah, I don't I drink know. either, so I just yeah, want, can I, mean, I bring I my grandkids there for some food? I have no desire to anymore, so. <laughs> No, um, I would kind of, I would say it's more of an upscale, family casual environment. Okay, that's what you're going for. Correct. In here. Okay. Correct. Kind of a marketplace environment that people can come and enjoy and have fun. Will it be breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or just lunch and dinner, or breakfast, I mean, as um, lunch and dinner. Lunch and dinner. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Probably. You know, we we are we are working on a concept that doesn't compete with our two restaurants that we have. Yeah. So it'll be something completely different that actually adds to our restaurants. Right. And adds to other restaurants that are coming to town. Right. I mean, I personally am kind of excited with the growth in Loomis right now. You know, finally Horseshoe Bar and Grill has got some movement. Yeah. Finally, Star Liquor's got some movement. When I opened up High Hand, I was it. Everybody thought I was crazy. I was it. And so all these years later, what, 10, 15 years later, you know, LBB has come in and put their stake on the moon. Um, other people are starting to do it. And I think I think the best days of Loomis is yet to come. I agree. And I think it's going to come quicker than we think. I really appreciate you believing in Loomis. Absolutely. I've been here since I was a child. So I can, right. you know, before there were stoplights, I was here. So, yeah. Yeah. That's just awesome, and I the the plans look amazing, and we look forward to seeing it grow. And and, and it's a little bit on the on like the non-alcoholic, you know, LBB. You know, we're actually looking at you know consumers drinking actually less alcohol, you know, or lower ABV, you know, even you know three and a half percent in a kombuchas, you know, craft sodas. Um, even the um, you know the seltzers you know we're working on you know kind of you know kind of diversifying a little bit of really that weekend crowd you know we the brewery really stuck by our guns of being uh, over 21 it was more our license actually most people don't know but our license allowed us to have people under 21 it was more of a family choice of really just the atmosphere toe catchers responsibility of parents it, no matter what's going to fall on us really, you know no matter what the situation right so this side is really more for that family to come through on the Saturday Sunday get a bread basket uh, bought our, uh, our root beer are you going to craft a homemade root beer thing <laughs> yeah, we already have it at the pub yeah yeah, so yeah. yeah it, but it's, it's duplicating that more of that segment to make it more of that family blanket throw a blanket out, the kids run around, the playground area, you know, just uh, yeah. incorporate more of that family aspect of not just a big drunken, yeah. you know, yeah. that's I, why we close at 9 o'clock and, you know, we, we, we don't want that either. Yeah. We want that shared, you know, kind of perspective. Of it. I super appreciate that. Absolutely. Great, great. Thanks. I have, we, I, I'm just starting to have kids too, so I want to take my kids and yeah. throw a blanket out and can we go check on work and just enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Okay. I guess uh, the only thing I was noted noting, and it just uh, it's PCWA has that water line, and they need an easement, and it's supposed to be unobstructed. And I know we're not looking at uh, uh, phase two, but it appears that the end of the amphitheater uh, has like maybe a walkway and some stairs that's actually built over that easement. Was that um, so? I it's presume actually, it'll be. It's a, it, the amphitheater. If we were to build a structure right. in front of that easement, you know. So yes. So there's landscaping and. So you're worried there's kind of a conflict there on the drawing. We're completely aware, and we're certainly going to mitigate. Yeah. It okay. The other com comment I had, and then I just, it just keeps going into my mind, and maybe I'm uh, over worrying about something. But the railroad, and I was reading the section from the railroad, and they seem to be pretty adamant and pretty concerned that, about the protection of of the trains going by and the project not interfering. And of course, it won't. And I'm thinking about the fence. Um, and one thing that popped into my mind is, you know, the proximity of people and I don't know how close the seating is going to be to the fence but sometimes people can get horsing around is there any temptation or worry that they might want to like 
kids climbing the fence. And I was thinking, like, do you want a no climb fence? Electric? Uh, electric. No. <laughs> I, cars, I, I, guns. I mean, come on, we have all kinds of options available. I, 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 I actually thought of that. <laughs> well, it only takes once. Yeah. The, the, the intention, we thought about that, and we, we've made contact with the railroad, and their letter back to us is so they just want to see where we're going to put the fence. Mm -hmm. and so our intention is to run the cyclone fence from its current location behind High Hand, because I've done that uh -huh. to connect with the city fence yeah. um, down to uh, the SP or down to the railroad fence along that. And it'll be an eight foot tall cyclone fence. Yep. Our public access to it is probably 20, 30, 40 feet away from where, say, the grass is. So I think we have plenty of buffer there. Plus, we have armed guards and electricity and all kinds of other <laughs> So it's about 20 feet from where people will be sitting to the fence? 20, 30 feet probably. Yeah. Okay. I mean, That's... it's more of a walking corridor up there. You okay. Know, from from that, it's uh, also um, uh, emergency access. There's all there's a utility little utility corridor there. All kinds of things. There, okay. So. And you think uh, no trespassing signs adequate? They don't need a stronger sign like warning danger. Uh, you know, active train. I, I sometimes think if you say warning danger, it's like don't touch the stove. It's hot, son. Yeah. <laughs> What's the first thing you're going to go do? You're going to touch a stove, right? And uh, I think if we adequately landscape it and create that barrier. And fence it. So there'll be a landscape barrier there there'll be too. A landscape okay. barrier there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, behind 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 high hand, I have uh, morning glory that grows onto it. You can't even see the trains that goes by. Okay. So you know, our intention is to create a green wall there and kind of make it out of sight, out of mind. When the train comes through, I think beers are up for sale for a dollar during that <laughs> minute and a half as it comes through. And we thought this through a little bit. Here comes the whistle. Get in line, you know. But we'll see what fun we can have with the train because it is our neighbor and we're going to live with it and we're going to use it right. to our advantage in that sense. Yeah. We yeah. talked about kind of what Roseville has done. You know, I did redevelopment down there. Is actually making a platform where the kids, like my kids, love watching. You watch out here when they come by. They all love oh. watching. It. You know, we actually make a a train platform where you know it's another structure within the structure where they come. But it raises up and they can see it and take pictures. It's you know exactly what you know encompass what your history and yeah. is part of it. You know. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. That. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have to re retrofit the building all for the, all the shaking that's going to happen? Or? No, that's part of the. That's, that's part, part of the, the fun. That's part of the panache. <laughs> just, yeah, it's it's like our greenhouse at High Hand. You know, it's a greenhouse with a hinge in the roof, right? Because it opens up. Do you think it's watertight? <laughs> I mean, it's just part of our thing. In the winter time, you're in a greenhouse. It's raining. Yeah. It's wet. Yeah. People sit. We put a bucket on the ground. So <laughs> we'll work it out. <laughs> so I did notice that the comments from Union Pacific was about the um, potential for an increase of frequency of train service. Did they provide any more information about that? Because I know that there has been speculation about a third rail going in, increasing the capital corridor to like 10 times a day. So I haven't heard anything. Um, you know, High Hand was there before they welded those rails, mm -hmm. and it's there after the rails. What I will tell you, the train's actually very quiet. Yeah. Uh, you can sit, before you couldn't have a conversation in the restaurant before, the, you know, they came through well with the rails, what, two or three years ago. Um, now you can actually sit there. Once the engines go by, you can barely actually hear the train. Uh, it's just a nice little hum, more than a click, 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 click. So I'm actually not, con I'm personally not concerned about it, as the town might be, but I'm, I'm not. I love trains. It's loud in here. Yeah. <coughs> okay, anything else? Uh before we move on to public comment, got something, Jean? I, I guess my only question is, when can I tell my LVB friends that you're going to be looking at opening up? Sean, city staff, <laughs> when's that date opening? <laughs> is it going to be faster than the sandwich shop? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> In proportion, I guess. Yeah. It's like one's dog ears and one's not dog ears, I've, right? I've, I've read them about it several times. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're going to move as fast as we possibly can to make sense, you know, and we're not going to sit idle. So, okay. All right, well, next we're going to go to uh, public comment and then uh, so. Kind of listen to the, the questions, and at the, after that, you will have an opportunity to rebut or answer any uh, questions that might arise from public comment. Great. Thank so, you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Public comment, please. And 
Generally, we try, there's not a lot of people here, so I don't think it's an issue, but if you go way over three minutes, we're going to stop you. So three <laughs> you know minutes is kind of... Wow, just point with arena numbers. Yeah. Wow, did someone <laughs> get something right? I, my hat is off to Sean, uh, uh, and Mary Beth, whoever designed this, this says Loomis. Yeah. That look, whoever the architect is, they should be required in the general plan to design anything on the road. <laughs> the, the, I, like I said, this is a plan I am, I am so impressed with, the look, the layout. Now, there's always a but. I have been known to tip back a couple. And this reminds me a lot of Firestone Brewery down in Paso Robles. Absolutely beautiful, the steel, the wood, the blue colors have to stay. Uh, do not cover up the fence, please. Hoppas down in San Jose, that is the worst spot to find a table on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon is the ones that are lined up along the railroad tracks. All the families line up. They have a, 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 a chalkboard that tells you the times the trains are coming by. I, with Commissioner Kelly, I don't want it just to become an adult place. And I've seen Hoppas. I've also seen Anderson Valley Brewery in Boonville. They cater to a family stop. It's not just to go in there and drink. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of it is the tours. Everybody loves the tours. We've done enough winery tours, God help me. But to see a brewery tour is absolutely wonderful. If the beer gardens on the left-hand side could be opened up into a big grass area where we can see the fence go through to the uh, trains, I guarantee it'll draw families in left and right. Because again, I've seen it work in San Jose and I've seen it work up in Anderson Valley. Like I said, the great, great, great job. I don't know what else to say. It's it's a beautiful piece of architecture for this town. Thank you. Thank you. William Conville Senior, 6280 Horseshoe Bar Road. You're all sitting down, right? I am in favor of this project. <laughs> I have read through more pages of stuff, and I love the colors. That was a plus. Um, yeah, we need more development like this in town. Thank you. Good, glad to hear. Thank you very much. Okay, so, oh, one more. I, I didn't see you there. You're sitting behind the. Okay. Uh, I have. So first of all, I want to say that I really like it. It looks good, but I have one comment that hasn't been brought up, and that is that there is on the master bike plan in Loomis, there's a bike lane, class one bike lane that goes right through there. And so if, if this goes in as proposed, then we have to redesign our bike lane um, because it goes right along the tracks. And so either one could be added. They don't look happy. So either one could be added or we have to redo the bike, the bike plane. So, okay, that's all I have to Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then seeing no other public comment, we'll close public comment. And if applicants, Scott, if you have any um, response to that, uh, what well, you don't need to, but if you'd like something to say, it's your opportunity. Well, thank you for your support. Um, I guess we have places to go and check out. Real trips to run, and thanks for that. Um, yeah. Um, as far as the bike lane is concerned, it's our intention to uh, connect down to that bike lane and maintain that thoroughfare as it's existing. Um, our sidewalk will go down along the front for um, pedestrian walkways and corridors and open up. I, I just want from that end to this end of town to make it very pedestrian friendly is really what the goal is. So mm -hmm. whether that's maintaining places for people to put their bikes, I mean, right now, high hand, uh, two days a week, they're, I've got 30 bike cars sitting in the back and told me you can park there as long as you're out of there by 11 o'clock because I open up for lunch. So far, so good, you know? So we have every intention on making that work for, for all these things. And so I think at the end, um, I, I think it'll work just fine. So that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, so we're going to uh, go ahead and we'll close the um
Could I ask a question of Mary Beth, maybe about the bike lane situation? Yes. So well, we're, to we're move, can it be moved? To, yeah. Oh, okay. We're, we're good. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask us to vote. <laughs> lawyer says I'm supposed to close the uh, okay. public hearing good. at this point, and now we're going to go ahead and bring it to commission uh, for <laughs> deliberation and staff questions of staff. Go okay. Ahead, Jean, sorry. So. If the bike, I'm just trying to comprehend this. I think you were saying the bike lane was supposed to be class one against the fence. fence. So is it in, in the plan that it would be moved out onto the road like the, re the rest of Taylor? It should be in the road like the rest, and I defer to Britt if you have that in your brain. So, yeah, the bike, the direct bike trail that runs up along uh, Loomis kind of transitions into an on-street bike trail class two. Um, since we don't have it going back behind along the railroad tracks this time, that's actually a good point to bring it out to transition into the bike, the bike lane that's on Taylor Road. Okay. So maybe well, my concern is we're hooking the sidewalk into that bike. <coughs> Lane. So you can't ride your bike on the sidewalk. Correct, but if there's on the pavement side, uh, on the road, there'll be a striped bike lane. Okay, but we need yep. to transition the bikes over there is what I'm saying. Right, they'll need to cross. See, we're hooking straight in. See the shade is going into the white? Uh, yeah, that new, that's new pavement. You're right, we'll need to have a, a okay. crossing of the street for the people who are going northbound on the bike lane. Yeah, we just don't want to run the bikes into the sidewalk, that's all. Okay. So this is something basically to be worked out with engineering on the <laughs> permit side. Okay. So I have another wish, and if we're, I hate to do this, it, part of me hates to do it, but if we're going to put in this amphitheater, we're showing a four-foot sidewalk, and that's single file. People walk single file on the four-foot sidewalk. So I would in, encourage a four-foot, a six-foot sidewalk there because we get a slug of people coming out of the amphitheater. And I'm thinking ahead about that. that so. I'm just going to go ahead and jump in right here. Whatever is considered phase two of this project, we're, that's not part of the consideration here today. That's not the project before you, so that can't be part of the consideration going into this approval today. If and when a phase two is brought forth, and if there's additional capacity needed for a sidewalk, that would be the time that that has to get factored into whatever that future project might be. Uh, in terms of the connectivity, we just did, you know, a pedestrian way in this downtown core. What is the width of the sidewalks just to try to maintain some consistency? So in the downtown area, we tried to do a six-foot sidewalk, although in a lot of situations where sidewalk already existed, it remained four feet wide. So in, in our requirements for uh, sidewalk in our uh, development standards, um, it's typically six feet wide for commercial uh, districts. Um, in the downtown core area, we do allow it to vary from four to six feet. You know, I might suggest maybe we go to five. Um, there might be the need for a wider sidewalk just to accommodate the people walking, you know, from one shed to the next, up and down the road, up to the multimodal the park. Four foot sidewalk is a residential. Yeah, that'd be that's, that's a little right. I mean, you can, we could we can you know the other project number two aside, you can forget all about that and still ask for a five foot sidewalk just for this project. Absolutely, is my point. Yeah. So, thanks, Greg. Okay. Is this project in in the area that? normally would have six feet that you, you yes our standards say that uh, commercial developments need a six foot sidewalk new a, a, a new commercial development outside the downtown district would require a six foot sidewalk but this downtown area is just specified as it varies depending on what okay. it's matching up to so is that something that the final determinations sit in your department Britt you make is that right with this or 
It could be mine or it could be yours tonight. Yeah, okay. Um, do we want to invite the applicant back to come in on that? I'm indifferent. I just want it to work. Um, my sidewalk currently is uh, in front of high hand is four feet. Okay. Um, so we would have to connect a four foot sidewalk to a six foot sidewalk. Um, and then we'd have to take that and transition that to a bike lane or end it somewhere. Um, I think that the sidewalks on the interior part of the project for crowd control, so let's say we did have 500 cars there and we had 500 people there. Uh, the interior sidewalks would be six or seven feet wide going to the parking lots where the cars are. So I don't see a lot of those people going out onto the city streets to go somewhere, you know, unless it's a walking corridor. So I think our sidewalks internally are going to be built to handle more people to get to the cars and, of course, our overflow parking, which uh, goes further down the project. So, but. I, I think also on Taylor Road, there might be some utilities there from PCWA that play in. There some, might be some, some physical restrictions that might play into that decision, whether it be five, four, three, you know, whatever. So I don't know if that helps out, but our intention is to make the interior sidewalks and walkways large, big, easy for multiple people to walk <coughs> as a group. So. Okay. Okay. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, sounds like it's, what do you think, Mike? Do you think it's something that we should leave it up to the engineering department to find out if there's any constraints and whether they can or can't do that? Go to maybe five feet? Well, I'd like, like to see six, but I don't I mean, necessarily think it should be a condition that we place upon them because of those kind of constrictions. Right, and also do it, it does it affect the bike lane, et cetera, because you're uh, taking away space. So mm -hmm. if those are problems that we're just, it's fine to say we want a wider sidewalk, but I'm, I'm happy to leave it with the engineering to us. If they can go a little wider, fine. If not, then at least stay with four. There is a pedestrian problem through that section as you come through. Um, high hand does a great business. Sunday mornings, people are walking in the street, and they have a four-foot sidewalk in front of a commercial development. I think there's some history of how that sidewalk got to be four feet, and it connects to a six-foot sidewalk. So, I would like to see a six-foot sidewalk. I'm, I'm not proposing a condition, mm -hmm. but I think that if we look at the engineering criteria, it should be a six foot side. It's a commercial area. And um, if we don't get it now, I doubt you're going to get it mm -hmm. with this development. Because coming back in the future for phase two, there'll be landscape improvements there, etc. And it's much more ex expensive to add on. Okay. It's really not real practical. So one additional consideration is that with condition of approval 32, you've got some discretion with Britt to approve a sidewalk plan that might be six feet given the circumstances. The, the way the condition reads is owner shall construct sidewalks to town standards and as approved by the town engineer. Okay. So if you're not looking to impose too know. strong a constriction right now, there's still some discretion for, yeah, that's why for sound judgment with Britt. Because you could be covering up a PCWA water line, or it may not work with the bike trail. Yeah, so that kind of engineering consideration is really factored into that condition of approval. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm happy with that to leave it with the engineering department to work it out and do the best it can. Okay. So I, it sounds right. like our preference would be six feet if that's reasonable if and feasible. Do, if that's doable. So maybe it has to go like this. <laughs> I can proceed under, under, this is the idea that I proceed under the, the town's projects. As I'm trying to build sidewalk in the downtown core area, um, I do take into consideration trying to make a six foot sidewalk and then looking at the existing right of way, the utilities, the other constraints that right. might narrow it. There are some sections of this new sidewalk that we're pro proposing to put in this year um, that do 
choked down to four feet or five feet because we had some constraints. So I'll, I can take a look at that and use kind of the same type of engineering judgment and criteria that I used for the downtown master plan, plan project mm -hmm. because it is a goal of ours in this town to be able to walk from Blue Goose to this new site. So um, we want to be able to walk this entire downtown core area or have people push strollers and, and such. So. Um, Okay. And I, you know, I, I think a condition of approval is too rigid. Mm -hmm. I just to condition it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a rigid condition that you, you, you have to meet, and then you might get into some other problems. Right. Exactly. Right. That's why 30, okay. 32 is perfect. I right? think I think we'll leave it at that then. Yeah. Just, Sean, go ahead. Sean Rebate, town manager. I just wanted to add too. There, there's two water vaults, PCWA water vaults, and I think they're. I think they're. Is there? Are they right there? Or are they farther down here? Yeah, so there's there's two big water vaults that could potentially conflict with doing a six foot wide sidewalk there. So, I, you know, the way that the engine, the way that the uh, that the uh, condition of approval has been modified for number 32, saying it meets town standards and is approved by the town engineer, I think that's probably about as good as you can get. I mean, we can't really force them to build something past town standards anyway. So, okay, just for what it's worth. Great, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, any other comments, questions? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and move along and ask for a motion. And recommended action tonight is to adopt recommended uh, the notice of exemption um, for for CEQA. And the other is uh, adopt resolution number 20-1, uh, approving a conditional use permit. And I don't think we really changed any of the conditions other than the revised conditions that was presented earlier. So including the, revi the revised the re conditions? The revised conditions, yeah. I make a motion that we adopt resolution 20-01 with the findings that the project is categorically exempt from provisions of CEQA under the section cited. It's consistent with the town goals and policies and subject to design review and conditional use permit requirements with the revised conditions that have been right. I that second. get it covered? Yeah. I so. think so. And I second. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Kelly? Aye. Commissioner London? Aye. Commissioner Hogan? Yes. Chairman O'Brien? Yes. All right, thank you. Congratulations. Great job. We're really, everybody's looking forward to it. Okay, good night. Oh, I'm sorry. The meeting's not, uh, meeting's not over <laughs> quite yet. Uh, they can go if they want. Uh, where do I get down? Let's see. Where we go. Uh, let's see. That's the certification. Uh, Mary Beth, do you have your uh, planning uh, director's report? Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I, I can tell you that we were recently approved for our SB2 planning grant. So that's $160,000 coming our way for the general plan update and some updated software for the building department was oh. one of the components in there. Right. So there's a second round of funding on that same two pro that same SB2 program coming up in the spring. That'll be another $65,000. We'll make application for that to further our general plan processing. So, okay. um, other than that, next council meeting we'll have a presentation on the general plan update um, and a more refined timeline, uh, workshop schedules and things as we start pulling this thing together. So, and that's uh, that meeting would be February 11th. 11th, yes. Okay, that's a council meeting. Council meeting. Okay, and next planning commission's on February 25th. 25th, okay. correct. All righty. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.